Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the YouTube Creators Hub podcast. Dusty here, the host of the show, as always, joined today by Elise. Uh, she is the creator behind the La Petite Saint Crochet YouTube channel. She's an avid crocheter and knitter. She loves being able to create beautiful things with her own hands. The only thing that brings her more joy is being able to help others discover their own creativity through yarn crafts and her YouTube channel. She has amassed, get this, 98,000 subscribers in only 250 videos, which is a feat in itself and has grown a great community over on her YouTube channel. Elise, how are you doing today? Oh, well, I'm blushing right now with all your wonderful compliments there, but um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here, Dusty. It really is an honor. Well, I tell you, you have done something that very few ever do. You are on the precipice of reaching that 100,000 subscriber mark. I don't know the data behind it offhand, but I will say that very few people ever reach that milestone. So congratulations to you. You're doing, obviously, you. you're doing something right. Uh, and by watching some of your videos in preparation for this interview, I can say uh, two things. Number one, your thumbnail design is to me, one of the best that I've ever have had here on the podcast. You're doing a oh, great wow, job. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll definitely <laughs> dive into that. But okay. before we do yeah. any of that, I want to talk about the origin story of the La Petite Saint Crochet YouTube channel. And I'm sure I'm going to get okay. tongue-tied saying that. Uh, but give, okay, us the, do too. <laughs> give us the whole story, Elise, of how this whole thing started. Well, it started back in 2016. I hadn't even started my channel yet, but um, I'm a mom of four kids. And um, at that point, my third child, my oldest son, was experiencing a lot of health problems. He has epilepsy. And up until that point, it was pretty well controlled, but it went out of control. And I was at a loss for what to do. We'd been a very active family and all of a sudden everything came to a screeching halt and we were at home and I was dealing with a 17 year old who was struggling himself. And I was driving him and everybody else crazy, including myself. And I knew that I needed a hobby. So I jumped onto Pinterest and I just started looking and I was like, I'm finding a craft tonight. I need something to do with my hands. And I stumbled upon a beautiful granny square blanket. And I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to make that. Long story short, my grandmother had taught me some basics of crochet, so I was able to pick it up pretty quickly by looking on YouTube and finding all these wonderful tutorials. And I knew really quickly that this was something that I wanted to do. And I was retiring from homeschooling my kids. I homeschooled for 20 years and I was ready to move into that next phase of life. And I didn't know what it was yet, but I started to feel like this crocheting thing might be something that I want to pursue. And to make that longer story even shorter, I found a course, I took a course, and I thought this is what I'm going to do, and that's how the channel actually started. That is awesome. So you had no experience with crochet, crocheting or yarn work before you decided to take the courses? I had I had a little bit. Like I said, my grandmother had showed me a little bit. I had dabbled here and there, but I was not proficient. I had very elementary basic skills up until 2016. And I'm the kind of person that when I fall in love with something, I am all in. Mm. <laughs> I'm all in. Me too. I am the same exact way. When I get yeah. on a tangent with something, I just go whole hog. My wife tells me that it's uh it's it's quite alarming to her at times when I get into <laughs> something, I'm going to dive deep into it. So yeah. uh, it's good to hear there's others like me out there. Yes, yes. <laughs> um so the YouTube thing, you know, yeah. you obviously studied on YouTube. You you learned the art, the craft on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, yes. along other things as well. What made you decide, "Hey, I'm going to start teaching others how to do this. I'm going to feature what I'm doing on the channel." And and was it just you needed a creative outlet? Part of it was that I wanted more of a creative outlet. Part of it was I needed people to talk to about this because I'm really, really passionate about it and I wanted to share it with others. But also I was seeing these benefits outside of being able to make beautiful things. I was finding so much peace and calm because this was a few years of my son's health not being very good. And I found that crocheting, there was a real meditative part of crocheting by making stitches over and over again really felt calming. And I thought people need to know about this. This really needs to be something. And I want to, I want to be the evangelist for crocheting to help people because I know 
we all have so many struggles in our life. And I knew that this was a tool that some people could use to make their life better. I love that. And now, how did you learn the YouTube side of things? What was that oh, process? <laughs> that was the hardest part, to be honest, because... Until that point, I, and this isn't even an exaggeration, I didn't know how to an to add an attachment on an email. Oh, I wow. was so technologically um, just a newbie. I was afraid of technology. I could do very basic things. So that was such a huge learning curve. So I did take a beginner's YouTube course that helped me. Um, and that was that's kind of got the wheels going. And then it was basically just making videos and I would know this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. And so I would find another resource or I'd find other videos on YouTube to like, how do I make these videos better? How do I do this better? And it was just adding one little piece at a time. So once you decided to get on YouTube and you'd already learned the craft, at least to a certain extent, yeah, your channel is obviously very successful. I hope you know and understand how successful it is in such a quick amount of time. What are a couple of things that you would attribute that to? Looking back now, 250 videos into this thing, what are some things that you did that you noticed really moved the needle and helped you kind of push your channel forward to grow the channel? The first thing that I would say is I was always willing to be self-critical, not, not super self-critical where I would sabotage myself, but enough to know I can get better. And I know that some of your, you know, viewers might know of Mr. Beast. Um, he is a fellow North Carolinian and I really appreciate, and I've watched some interviews with him and he's always said, make each video 1% better than the last one. And so my goal has always been each video, just try to be a little bit better, try to bring my personality more into it or make that thumbnail better or say things a little bit quicker, not just say, uh, well, and one thing that I do for every single video is I script things out. Now, I don't follow the script, but I need an outline. I want to know what what points am I going to make for every single video. I think that's really important. But also, I have prioritized connecting with my community. I try to respond to every single comment that comes into my channel. It's getting harder, to be honest, but it's something that I still value I know that I could pay somebody else to do that, but I feel like there would be a disconnect with that community. So I try really hard. I spend time every single day getting into my comments and responding to people, connecting with people and hearing their thoughts on things. So I want to focus in on the being self-critical, being able to mm -hmm. criticize and watch your content and say, hey, that's not good because you opened the right. interview with that. I think that Oftentimes, creators are so defensive and mm. they get their feelings hurt very quickly. Um, you yeah. know, you, you've got to have thick skin, regardless of how good your oh, community yes. is. You're going to have mm -hmm. people out there that are going to be overly critical. They're going to be keyboard, yeah. keyboard warriors and they're going to say yeah. some hurtful and some mean things. Yeah. So when it came for you, Elise, being self-critical, what were the what were the things that would go through your head? How would you analyze the video? What were some points that you'd look at and say, this could be better, that could be better? Mm -hmm. I would look at creators that I really, really liked. Um, and outside of crocheting, I, I wasn't just watching crocheting and knitting channels. I was looking at other creators that I thought, wow, they're really doing something great there. And I would try to think, why is that video good? Why do I want to stay till the end of that video? What makes me want to click on that video? Mm. And I would try to see how can I do that in my own videos? And I I knew from the very beginning, listen, my kids were young adults and teenagers at that time. And they were honest with me about, hey, mom, that was not good. You sounded so awkward there <laughs> or whatever. So I began to try to become a student of YouTube because I am i didn't grow up with technology. I'm almost 50 years old and I didn't grow up with that. So it's something that I had to think, all right, I need to study this. I need to look at this with eyes that are not defensive, like you said, and try to get better and see why are those channels that I really like? Why do I like them? Um, and secondly, those comments that sometimes come in that aren't the kindest sometimes there's truth in them there's a little bit. and there have been a handful of comments that I have read that at first it got my hackles up and I felt defensive about them. And I thought you are just, you're just such a jerk. But then when I really thought about it, you know what? They're kind of right. <laughs> and so I 
don't mind those comments now because I actually think they've made me better. So I, I'm, I'm okay with constructive criticism. Of course, I would like it if it was kind, but sometimes it's not. But I try not to get my ego in the middle of that and try to see, is there something that I can take from this to make it better? It's one of the superpowers that I call them superpowers that creators have if they're able to just let things kind of bounce off or rub off their yeah. shoulders and be able mm -hmm. to take criticism and utilize it for good and not let it yeah. take you down. Because what happens is a lot of creators get those uh, critical comments or feedback from their friends or loved ones. And all it does is it it gives them hesitancy of uploading again. Right. And mm -hmm. I want to encourage people listening to this to to not do that. Um, right. I want to I want to now transition to your cadence of uploads. Um, it looks right. like you're kind of on an every once per week kind of upload schedule now. Talk mm -hmm. about how you think that has impacted your channel and how that has evolved over time. I really started out with the goal of doing once a week. And I, I knew that the type of videos that I wanted to do with as much editing as I do on my videos, that I really would rather have quality versus quantity. Um, and so I really stuck to that. And I also have a long game approach with YouTube. I know that there are creators and I've seen them before where they're pumping out the content and they're getting it out there and they're growing super, super fast, but they can't maintain that pace. I always wanted to have a pace that I felt like I can maintain this for the long haul. Um, and about maybe four months ago or so, I started adding in a YouTube short. Um, and those are pretty quick. And my goal is always to get quicker with my editing and just get things done a little bit faster. But um, so I have added that in within the last few months. So um, but I feel like looking at it as a marathon, not a sprint is good. And I think slower growth is is sustainable growth. And it's something that will continue rather than just a big jump. People think that you can't grow on YouTube anymore. When did you start YouTube? What, when was your start date? I, I started the channel in 2018, but I didn't start uploading regularly until January of 19, 2019. And to be honest, I wasn't making like real videos. I was like kind of playing around and um, just adding like one or two minute videos because I didn't know what I was doing. So it took me some time to figure it out and to kind of get the ball rolling. But it really was 2019 when I was like, all right, I'm going to do this once a week. Yeah. Um, and I do think that people can still grow on YouTube. I, I, a hundred percent, I believe that. What do you think is different about your channel? Because I was looking, when I was looking for people in the crafting space to invite onto the podcast, there are a ton of people doing crochet oh, yeah. and knitting. So it's not like you picked a niche that's empty or, you know, was, 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 you oh, know, yeah. there, there's, there's people there. So what makes you mm -hmm. different? Like what made you stand out? Why, why, why do you think your community was one of the ones that took off? I think the thing that was different about my channel was a lot of crocheting and knitting channels are tutorials. You see their hands, you never see their face, you don't get to know the creator as a person. And I wanted to connect with other makers. I wanted to be a part of who they are. We were the same. The person that was watching my videos was me. Um, we are all men and women who love crafting and we're not perfect and we want to get better and we geek out about this pattern or this conference coming up or this new yarn release. And I wanted to bring that. And I think that was kind of a, a subconscious thing that I did. But I, I also kind of felt like I wasn't like those other channels because these were the big guys who had big, big, big channels. So I knew I wasn't that. So I wasn't going to try to be that. I just thought I'll be me. And if people like me, great. And if not, I'm still going to do it because I'm having fun with it. Something else that I have to talk about when it comes to your story, there's two pieces of it. I want to start with the first piece and get your response. And then I'll go to the, to, to the next piece. Personality does play a role in on YouTube. And if you said that it didn't, then you would be, you would really not be truthful with the people who are like, whether they're hiring me to coach them, or if they're listening to this podcast, people can already listen. We're 12, 15 minutes into this episode and recording. You have a personality. You have a good personality. You're not only are you knowledgeable, but you can present it in a very good way. Uh, you're very uh, upbeat. You're very positive. You present yourself well. So personality by far takes a lot more, I don't want to say 
a big role in it, but it does play a role in it. And I wanted to get your feedback on that because people are connecting with you. Your face is all over the thumbnail. It's in the Mm -hmm. video. you're, You're recording yourself. How big of a role do you think that played in that, hey, this is a, a, a lady who is is nearing her 50s, she's retired, um, you know, she's in this stage of her life. How much of a role did that play in, in maybe helping you grow your channel? In the beginning, I was very afraid to share my personality. I tried to look <laughs> back on some of my first videos and I'm like a little anchor woman. Hello, how are you? I was very stiff and um, I realized that that's that's not fun. And I think the more comfortable I got on camera, the more I was able to be myself. And I started to see that the videos that I was really being myself or I went on some tangent and some rant about something or I just talked all about some yarn and really spoke from the heart. People really connected with that. And I was like, oh, okay, they might really want to see the real Elise here. And so I've over time been able and felt more comfortable showing more and more of my personality. And I think that that's only been a benefit. And I think that the good thing is that it kind of weeds out the people who aren't your people. And I used to try to be everything to everybody. Like I wanted everybody who came to my channel would like me. Well, there's going to be people who I'm just too loud, (laughs) too bright. I'm too, you know, talk with my hands a lot. And I, I think that was for me being okay with that, that the people who came to my channel and really enjoyed what I had would actually really like me and like what I had to offer. And I could actually help them um, because they could connect with me. So I do think the personality is huge. Yeah. You hit the record button and there's nothing that turns people into a robot uh, more than a, than a record button. Uh, It's funny when I first started, I I would hit record on my audio recorder and I would all of a sudden put on that radio voice. Hey, ladies and you know, but that's, that's not who I, you know, this is me talking to you, Elise right now. And so the more conversational I got with my podcast and with my my YouTube channel, the more success that I had, because they realized that I wasn't just some guy behind a microphone. You know, it was Dusty who's got two young daughters and he's he's married and he's got a dog and a cat. Like they be- right. began to know me and understand uh, my struggles. And I began to share, you know, when my grandmother mother passed away a couple months back, I shared that on the podcast. It was a yeah. very in- intimate moment. Being able to be real with people uh, is is a very big deal. All right. So yeah. part, part B of of this story is is I want to kind of intertwine it into this next question, talking about uh, making money and, and and making this a business because you are you're making money from this. So I want to know uh, the first part of the question is how are you monetizing? How are you making money with the channel? Um, and then. You know, if you don't mind sharing maybe some averages of, of, of what a channel your size and your niche makes. Yeah. So I um, obviously make money from YouTube AdSense, Google AdSense. Um, I also have a blog um, and I send people through uh, my videos onto my blog. I offer patterns and I have affiliate marketing. So, you know, I have all of those little things in there and um, I think that's really important and that's something that I've tried really hard to do because we don't own YouTube and at any moment they could shut your channel down or something could happen or any number of things can happen. So I've tried to make sure that I have multiple streams of income and that's just happened over time, a little bit here and adding something and then adding something else. So that's kind of my goal is to have a lot of little pots so that if one thing goes away, the other ones can hopefully make up. Um, And on YouTube right now, this is 2023 has been my biggest year so far. Um, and I, I will mention that it's partly due to my thumbnails because I've changed them significantly in the past few months. And that's made a huge, huge difference for my channel. But now I would say, so it's hard for me to average because up until maybe three months ago, I was averaging between maybe one and 2000 a month on Google AdSense. And now I'm averaging more like 25 to 4,000 a month on mm-hmm. Google AdSense. Mm-hmm. And then- do you mind giving averages on like how much money are you making through affiliate and selling your patterns? I mean, is that a significant amount? That can of- be, it's not significant. It doesn't match it at all. Google AdSense is the majority by far of my income at this point. So at, you know, it really depends with the um, affiliates because 
uh, if I mention a course or something where the affiliate um, percentage is really high. So that month could be maybe I made a thousand dollars that month on affiliate marketing, but it could be as low as 400 somewhere in that range kind of is a normal range for me. Sure. Um, and then if I sell a pattern, I come out with a new pattern. I might make another five hundred dollars that month. But on a normal month where I'm not publishing a new pattern, it might only be a hundred, hundred, maybe two hundred dollars somewhere in there. So those are a little bit more smaller amounts. So the Google AdSense is is my main source of income at this point. And here's what I'm going to say. This should excite you, Elise, and those people listening. She is just at the very beginning of what she can make. These numbers, let's just say she's averaging $3,200 to say $5,000 a month with everything kind of out the door. This is the beginning. I think Elise could be making ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month, even as early as next year uh, going forward, because the opportunities for her uh, to sell these patterns, to have the blog, to where you can have affiliates. If you noticed, listener, if you're listening, uh, hopefully you are. She's diversifying her income streams, and that is such a big deal. Not counting on YouTube. I just recorded an episode for my podcast talking about newsletters, email newsletters, and affiliate marketing, and finding ways to diversify your income. Uh, and congratulations to you, Elise. I think you are on the path to making a whole bunch of money. Uh, and yeah. so uh, that's really neat to hear. Now. Perfect transition. You talked about your thumbnails. I can go mm -hmm. and scroll through your channel and I can see the changes that you've made in your thumbnail. Yeah. But I want you to talk about it in detail. You had a video just over right at two months ago called 12 Ridiculously Simple Ways to Use Up Yarn Scraps. And it's a picture mm -hmm. of you holding like this mess of a ball of yarn in your hand with like a, a funny, excited look on your face. It's so colorful. It's so vibrant. That video is closing in on 400,000 views within just two months. So you're obviously doing something right. Give us the crash course on how to design thumbnails that will make a difference for your channel. So I did not like those YouTube thumbnails for a long time, and I didn't do them on my channel because I thought they were cheesy. I thought, ugh, I don't like that. That's not who I am. And then I made a thumbnail um, maybe four months ago, um, and that was all about uh, Amazon products that I don't, don't buy these crochet gadgets from Amazon. And I ran out of time. I had to get a thumbnail done, and I thought, I'm just going to make one of those dumb faces for the thumbnail. And that video has over 500,000 views on it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I think I need to rethink this whole thing. So I ended up um, actually hiring my daughter, who was my biggest critic in the beginning. She's 25. And I just said, listen, I need you to help me come up with good thumbnails because she grew up watching YouTube and she kind of knew. And this was something really awkward for me. So she has actually really helped me to be like, mom, you need to make the face. You need to put your face on the thumbnail. It's really important. So I started doing that and I started realizing you've got to make that face that somebody wants. They, they're scrolling through, they're looking through all these thumbnails and they see yours and go, oh, it kind of stops them in their tracks a little bit. And I have found that brighter is better if you can up that brightness a little bit so that it's really stands out. It's not, I used to like the dark moody, mm -mm, those don't work at all. <laughs> it's bright and I try to up that saturation a little bit or that vibrant so that those colors really pop out. And um, that's really, and, and maybe a little text on there that says something like, don't do this, or this is the latest, greatest thing. Something that will get people to just stop for a second, because if you can get them to click on the video, that is the, that's your biggest hurdle right there. Just get them to click on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now a couple of follow-ups on that. Um, did you, how are you taking these pictures? Like, are you using your phone, your camera? What's the process there? I used to do it on my, my camera and it was just such a complicated process that I finally yes. went, listen, this isn't going to be published in a magazine or something. This doesn't need to be blown up. I'm going to just do it on my phone. And I've got um, an iPhone that's a couple, I think it's an iPhone 12. It's a couple of years old but it works just fine. It's and totally do you, do fine. Do you just hold it like you're taking a selfie or do you have like a little tripod you bought on Amazon? I have a Amazon? little tripod. Yeah, okay. I just have a simple, easy little tripod, yeah. And when it comes to lighting and getting the best, I mean, are you doing it in your office, outside? What have you yeah. learned to work best? I do it in my craft room, which is in my basement laundry room. <laughs> and I have no natural lighting in here. So I do have studio lights in here. 
Um, that way it's a little bit brighter because otherwise it'd be pretty dark in here. And where are you designing these and how are you designing them? Um, I first go into Lightroom and that way I can just um, edit them a little bit and bring that brightness up and bring those colors out and sharpen them a little bit and just try to make them look the best that they can. And then I just go into Canva and design it with the text and anything else that I want to add to it. I just, I love it. And I agree with you. I think your thumbnail change has been a big uh, help for you and in, in what yes. your channel is for sure. Um, mm -hmm. What is something you wish you would have known sooner? Looking back at your YouTube journey now, 250 videos in, uh, what is something that you're like, man, I, I just, I wish I would have known that sooner. I wish that I had known closer to the beginning that this was going to eventually pay off because I can't tell you how many times I almost quit. Mm. <laughs> like, Many, many times I thought, this isn't worth it. I am busting my rear end to, for what? And so for many, I mean, this is really 2022. I started making a little bit of money, but this year is the first year where I'm like, I'm actually making enough money to feel like this is starting to be worth it. Um, thankfully, I don't need to support our family. Um, my husband has a good job, but at least this is this is providing for our family. But um, I wish that I had known it's going to work out. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep working, keep getting better, but it, it it will happen. You just have to be consistent and keep going. What got you through those negative thoughts? What made you push forward? You know what? <laughs> this is a funny one because sometimes I will think about people who, there are some people who didn't believe in what I was doing and thought that I was kind of making a fool out of myself or kind of treated me the, in the crafting community, not very many, but there were a handful that kind of looked at me like, that's this kind of a silly thing for this middle-aged woman to be doing that. And when I would feel really down, like I just, my videos are terrible and nobody's watching them. Why am I doing this? I would think I'm not giving up. I'm not going to give up because I'm going to prove them wrong. And so I know that that might not be the best motivation, but sometimes that was the thing that would make me say, get out of bed, go make that video because you're going to prove them wrong. I love that motivation. I love it. I love it. It gets me pumped up to hear you talk right. about that. Yeah. Just <laughs> stick it to them, Elise. I love it. Right. That's just, that's right. amazing. Um, in conclusion of this episode, and by the way, you, you've been a great guest. Thank you so much for all this knowledge you. that you've shared with us. Um, what's next for the channel? Like, what are you looking to do short term and long term to continue to grow and continue to build what you've built upon so far? Um, I want to continue to um, learn how to negotiate sponsorships. That's something that I've had to really step out and ask for what I want. If a company comes to me and um, a recent one that I did, they offered me the money and I was I was like, ooh, I'm going to say, no, I want to double that. And they were like, okay, sure, no problem. So that's something that I want to get better at. And I want to offer more of my own products for sale. So that's something I want to really focus on this year. I love that. And can you tell my audience where they can get in touch with you online? Yep. You can find me at Le Petit Saint Crochet on YouTube, on Instagram, Facebook, and my own blog. Elise, you have been amazing. What a what oh, a thanks. what a interview this has been. I know people are going to go back and listen to this over and over again. You've been awesome. And we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.